Thank you. So, <clears throat> first of all, I apologize for my voice. <laughs> it's, I have a cold. Yes, I found it. So, um, I'll try to speak close to the microphone so you can hear me. So, the topic that I'm going to cover is related to the fate of our universe <clears throat> and what string theory tells us about it. So I start with the basic motivation for string theory, which is, uh, starts all the way back from Einstein's theory, formed about 100 years ago. <clears throat> and this was a geometric theory of gravity, where curvature of space and time leads to gravitational effects. And uh, a decade or so after that, quantum theory was developed. And this was a kind of a very different kind of a geometry, somehow like a fuzzy geometry. And somehow they didn't work together very nicely. And when, we tr when physicists tried to combine them, there were always difficulties. <clears throat> so the clash uh, did not have a resolution until a few decades ago, where string theory emerged as a potential candidate for a framework where these two ideas in physics, these two pillars of physics, get unified and be, uh, be fitted in a consistent framework. So, um, so I'm going to talk about some basic things about string theory, but this fact that it combines these two pillars of physics is a highly non-trivial achievement. And there really isn't anything comparable today to the level of sophistication of string theory in the sense of combining these two theories in such a consistent way which is despite the fact that we don't have experimental verification of string theory, the fact that it is so non-trivial makes us believe in this theory. <clears throat> so this is the resolution of this puzzle we think is string theory, this, this framework. Now, um, strings basically, the idea is very simple, at, at least in the conceptual framework. It says that instead of having point particles, we replace them by one-dimensional strings loop-like objects, and um, perhaps they are vibrating, and different vibrational modes can lead to different particles. And also, we have learned in string theory that we can also have other dimensional extended objects, not just like one dimension, sometimes like membranes or higher dimensional ones. But the ex existence of these extra dimensional objects, the objects which require not just points to define, but extended uh, dimensions, like one dimension or two dimension, is crucial for the quantum theory of gravity to make sense. <clears throat> so it emerges out of this, this idea that we have to deal with strings, and everything is made of strings, these vibrating one-dimensional or perhaps higher-dimensional membranes. The basic idea is that the interaction of strings is, uh, is basically joining or going backwards in time splitting of two strings. Here you see two strings joining into one string, or you could reverse this uh, and go backwards of one string splitting to two. And this process of splitting and joining converts uh, uh, particles two to one or one to two. And in this way, it leads to interaction between particles. So this uh, framework leads to, first of all, unification of particles in terms of string excitations or string modes, as well as the interaction of string gives you the, all the forces between them in a very nice geometric fashion. So in a sense, it's a natural uh, con continuation or combination with Einstein's theory, which was a geometric theory of gr uh, gravity. String theory is a geometric theory of particles and interactions between them. But it comes with a price. At least it looked like a price when it was first understood. That string does not really make sense in 3 plus 1 dimensional space-time if you have nothing else. It seems like... There's some inconsistency with the theory if you demand it just to be 3 plus 1 dimensions. But we think we live in three macroscopic dimensions and one time, uh, whereas string theory requires extra dimensions. So these extra dimensions end up being a bit puzzling because we don't see them in the real world. So where are they? And so one resolution was offered where this idea of a Kaluza and Klein from a long time ago, where these extra dimensions could be compact little circles. So it's so small, you don't see in experiments. So there's no contradiction with everyday experiment. Well, this sounds a little like cheating. In other words, you have a problem, and you kind of hide it away. 
into these little tiny things. Is, it, is this extra dimension, are these extra dimensions good for anything is the question. In physics, when new ideas come, you should get some, some new ideas out of them, new physics out of them. It cannot be just something you get and then throw away. So this was not a little satisfactory that you have to just hide it away. Are they good for anything? Well, it turns out that <clears throat> these extra dimensions, which could be, for example, like circles, could have interesting possible structures. It doesn't have to be circles. It could be much more interesting. Um, for example, it could be a, more than one circle. It could be two circles, like a torus here. And objects like strings can wrap around, around them in different ways. For example, you can have a string wrapping one way corresponds to a particle in the blue dimensional space that we see. So if you think about this blue space as the macroscopic space that we see, and this tiny red space is that, or these inter internal tiny spaces that we don't see, uh, depending on how these strings wrap around, they correspond to different particles. So if a string wraps this way, it corresponds to this green particle. Or if it wraps the other way, it corresponds to the, you know, this other color, this other particle down here. Or if it's vibrating and not wrapping anything else, it could yet correspond to yet another particle here. So depending on the combination of these extended objects and the interplay between these extended objects and these extra dimensions, you get all these different kinds of variety of things that you can see down here. <clears throat> now, these extra dimensions, as I said, does not have to be circles. They can, for example, be spheres. Or in fact, they can be much more complicated. In fact, in string theory, we think, since we live in four dimensions, we think we can have up to six, seven, or even eight dimensions extra, depending on which corner of string parameters we are in. And extra dimensions give you a huge amount of varieties. You can have a huge amount of possibilities for what these spaces could be. And so here is a kind of a artistic, if you wish, a way of depicting how these extra dimensions could look like. It could be very complicated. So we don't, we don't have any fixed way to determine which one, which one of these spaces is the right one. In fact, we have learned in the context of string theory <clears throat> that there are a huge number of consistent ways these extra dimensions could look like. This is just a picture. It's, me it's meant to depict the complexity of these extra dimensions, the way the different cycles and things are entangled with each other in these extra dimensions and how many holes you have and so forth, are going to be crucial in what we end up getting and seeing in the macroscopic physics, in the, in the 3 plus 1 dimensional physics. For example, if you think about these extra dimensions, this complicated geometry in, the, in these, even though it's tiny, it could be very complicated. And this tiny geometry that we don't see with this complication could lead, depending on what kind of these extra objects there are and how they are wrapped around these different cycles, and what kind of structures they have relative to each other, they can give you a huge different variety of observed particles in three-dimensional space. They could give you different number of electrons with different masses and different properties, and so on. So you could have a huge plethora of possible universes. Each one of them would look like a consistent theory, but certainly not all of them are our theory. In fact, at most, one of them is the, is the universe we live in because we have a certain number of particles, and all of them could correspond to a particular universe, particular, therefore, extra geometry, extra dimension geometry. And we would like to find out which geometry is it. <clears throat> Without knowing which one is ours, we can only say that there's a landscape of all possibilities. This is a way to think about all the possibilities here. We just draw a landscape. And we think of each possible point on this landscape, a possible allowed universe, which comes for, from potentially very different geometries, internal geometries. So depending on what we de depict for these tiny extra de de geometries, you can get different kinds of points in this landscape. So that looks interesting. You might say, well, OK, there are 20 or 30 of these. Let's figure them out on which one is ours. Well, it turns out these are almost uncountable possibilities. We do not know, in fact, the full list of all these possibilities. It seems to be beyond our capability at this moment to really understand the totality of possibilities. The amount we know already is too big to kind of enumerate. So there's a huge variety of possibilities. 
So this, this looks a little daunting and in fact at some point disappointing because if it's so big and we're only one of these points, how are we going to ever figure out which one we are in? In fact, people said, look, you can be at any of these points, so forget about these extra ge geometries and just, just study downstairs the landscape and there will be some geometry which gets, leads to that. So the point about string theory and the landscape would be a little bit meaningless because you can just choose any physics you want and wish that something will give you that, and you don't need to know what gave you that. Well, um, <clears throat> since our universe is only one of them, that sounded like a possibility, in which case it would uh, detract from the importance or interest of string theory in the sense that we could not make predictive, power, predictive uh, statements from string theory. But the question arises, can any imaginable universe occur as a point in the string landscape? Is it truly the case that if you pick any point and say, well, I want this kind of physics, I want five electrons with these masses and two of these quarks and this and that, can you arrange that? Does that happen? <clears throat> and the answer turns out to be no, at least from what we know today in string theory. There seems to be things which look consistent to the naive eye, it looks almost consistent. You can just look like ordinary spectrum of particles and you know, electrons with various kinds of masses and this and that. But it seems not to arise in string theory. String theory says there's something more subtle about the consistency of a quantum theory of gravity. An example of this appears to be gravity as seems to be always the weakest force in all these points in the landscape we know. You know, you have electric forces. If you have two electrons, the repulsion is much stronger than the gravitational attractions. And it's true for all the other forces as well. So gravity is the weakest force in our universe. And it turns out to be so in all the universes we seem to get in string theory. It seems to be a general feature, even though we could have conceived of would-be universes in which gravity is not the weakest force. It doesn't occur. So therefore, there is a, bite, there is a, there is a tooth in string theory landscape in saying what arises or doesn't arise. So the things that don't arise, we call the swampland, which means they almost could be a landscape, but we are fooled of, for thinking it's a good landscape. It actually doesn't belong to a consistent uh, landscape of possibilities. And indeed, it seems like most of the points that you could imagine in physics are belong to the swampland. So in fact, string landscapes are very rare. Even though they're huge, they are very rare in terms of the possible conceivable consistent universes that you could think of. We do not have a deep understanding of how you distinguish which ones are the swampland and which ones are landscape. But the amount of examples we have covered in string landscape suggests indeed they are rare. The string landscape, despite being big, is far smaller than the old possibilities that you might imagine. <clears throat> now, I want to apply this idea, potentially, to the question that has to do with our universe about the the age of the universe and its lifetime. So first of all, let's remind ourselves that we, uh, so let me go back here. So we have a, here I'm depicting time axis as a horizontal axis. And I'm showing here the Big Bang and expansion of the universe and perhaps inflation here. And so we don't understand exactly what the details are here, but we now know we are somewhere here. And we know how things work after a certain beginning. Um, so we know that uh, about 14 billion years or so is where we are right now in terms of a time scale. And so the question is, will this continue to expand or will it end? What is the fate of our universe? Does string theory have anything to say about the fate of our universe? It turns out that the only universes that last forever in string theory, at least in all the points in string theory landscape that we are aware of, enjoy a property called supersymmetry. All the other universes, which could have conceivably lasted forever, seem to belong to the swampland. We don't have a proof of this statement, but it seems to be the case for all the examples we know. So supersymmetry is a key fact for, for stability, in a sense, and not to disappear and to, to, be, to be there forever. So do we have supersymmetry in our universe? What is supersymmetry? Well, it is a property that for every particle, there is an equivalent other particle with the same mass and all the same properties, except for deferring of a spin by half a unit 
in Planck units. So, so, if there's this, so if we have this symmetry for particles, then we have supersymmetry. Well, we look at our universe, and we find that we don't have this symmetry. The particles are on one side, not the other side. And uh, therefore, we don't have these particles observed. Therefore, we don't have supersymmetry. Therefore, our universe will not last forever, according to string theory, at least from the best we understand from string theory. <coughs> I wish I had a better news, <laughs> but, um, but anyhow, how long do we have, you might wonder. This is a crucial question. Uh, well, uh, first of all, let's, let's review some time scales. Um, this is our current age of the universe here. I'm pl plotting it in a log scale. We are about 10 to the 10 years, about 14 billion years. That's where we are right now. OK. Well, you might say we want to go forever, but I will warn you that that would not be very exciting because from the current theories that we know, from what we know about physics today, about the spectrum of particles, we predict that about 10 to the 35 years or maybe in that vicinity, all the protons will decay away. So all the things we are made of will decay away. So the life form will have to change dramatically if it's there by then anyhow. So it seems like the universe is going to change dramatically by the time you get to here anyhow. OK, that's already a bad news. <clears throat> what else? Well, it turns out our universe has dark energy. This was one of the spectacular discoveries of a decade or so ago. And it leads to a natural time scale in physics. So the existence of this dark energy gives you a new time scale in physics, which is 1 over the square root of this energy, basically. So it's a natural time scale in physics. You might ask, what is the relation of this time scale Potentially, could that be related to the lifetime of our universe? Well, where is that life time scale? It turns out that time scale is 10 to the 11 <coughs> billion years, 10 to the 11 years, or 100 billion years. It's a little too close to, for comfort <laughs> with our current age. Uh, it's like we are teenagers, like 14 years, and this is 100 years. <laughs> So, well, we don't know. Well, we don't know if this is the life of our lifetime. This is going to be the lifetime of our universe or not. This is a natural time scale. It doesn't mean it's the lifetime of our universe. Indeed, uh, trying to compute this lifetime in string theory is among the hardest things to do, it turns out, because we have to go away from supersymmetry and we lose control for computational ability in many ways. So, there are models within string theory that seem to suggest lifetimes much longer than 10 to the 11, perhaps. But the very fact that we live so close to this time scale raises the question. This is sometimes called the coincidence problem in physics. Why is it that this natural time scale is close to what our lifetime is? Why do we, why do we happen to live in this interesting era? <clears throat> we don't have a good answer, really, for this question. And it's a big question for the next decade. I would think that even though we may not be conclusively answered this within the next decade, at the very least, we can search through the string landscape and see what kind of lifetimes we get. Is it close to 10 to the 11, or is it much longer? How reliably can we come up with this estimate? At any rate, you might ask, OK, so when the decay happens, what happens? How does it exactly take, take, take us away, perhaps? Well, there are many ways, but the simplest way you can imagine is, you know, if you think about this as a picture of our universe somewhere, there would be Somewhere, something happens far away, and it starts growing with the speed of light moving further and further and taking over everything on its path very rapidly and erasing, basically, everything and erasing it, perhaps, and replacing it with a completely new universe, erasing us out. And that will basically be the end of our universe and end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>